works for me. Share. Can edit. See, it says can edit. Part is owner. Maybe that's better. Now share is owner. Um, yeah, exactly. That, I think that's, um, I, I searched for you and I couldn't find you on Twitter. I don't know if you're, if you're just, uh, reading. okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh, well, next time. Nope. We've done four, um, I mean, fundings by, uh, portfolio I will make you owner. We'll see, see if that helps. I did. I was like, that's Oh no, I guess I've been so I spent Carlos, is there a David Carlos in the in the house? My co-host. 
have it out of reach. Ten thousand. Very handsome looking individual with a suit and tie. Not quite that suit and tie. Yeah. Hey there. There you are. So if you haven't gotten a slice of pizza and you want one, now is the time to, to do that? Or a soda or both? Okay. <laughs> Is everybody set? Am I set? Our panel seems to be check, check. up there. Three quarters of the panel is here. We're missing Brad. Hopefully he'll make his way up momentarily. Um, so welcome to Ultralight Startups. My name is Graham Lawler. I am the founder of Ultralight Startups. And I will be one of your hosts tonight. And I'm David Carlos. I will be your other host. I have not founded anything in relation to Ultralight Startups. I am just a pretty face. Um, thank you, David. You're welcome. Um, so today is our uh, feedback forum and pitch showdown. Uh, so if you were here a month ago, you will be familiar with this format. If you were not here a month ago but have attended Ultralights in the past three years, this is a little bit different. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, format. Basically, it's like American Idol. Startups pitching to a panel of investors who are going to be asking some questions and then giving some helpful and practical advice to those uh, startups, what they can do tomorrow to increase the chances of success with their startup. Um, and there's two different contests that are going at the same time. We're basically voting for your favorite pitchers over Twitter and also voting for your favorite panelists over Twitter. And we'll talk about those prizes as well. So maybe we'll introduce our panel here to start with. So uh, first we have Gil Beda, who this is his second ultralight panel. He's the founder of Genicast Ventures and been the founding CTO of, uh, what, was it Dakota? Dakota and Real Media. And Real Media, two of New York City's uh, biggest startup exits, so he definitely knows this game. So do you want to talk about uh, Genicast? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So Genicast, so after the, uh, the, the acquisition of, of Dakota from AOL in, in 07, I partnered up in 08 with Comcast to do seed stage investing. Comcast has an internal fund where they do 2 to 20 million size investments. And we partnered up, both contributed capital uh, to form Genicast to do sub $1 million investments in internet technology companies in the Northeast. Um, we've made five investments so far, um, have been lucky enough to have a couple <coughs> exits already, and, um, and looking to pick up the pace and, and, and try to do you know, three or four new investments a year. Fantastic. So early stage tech investor and serial founder, successful founder as well. So next we have Brad Harrison, uh, who's managing partner at BHV and uh, partner at uh, Point Capital. So you want to talk about those? Uh... So I apologize. My voice is uh, kind of on the fritz. Um, so uh, Point Capital is a uh, early stage uh, merchant bank and broker dealer. BHV is an early stage media technology and entertainment focused uh Venture fund. Currently, we have uh, 13 portfolio companies spread between uh, New York, D.C., Austin, the Valley, and L.A. Uh, what we focus on is being able to work with entrepreneurs where we can leverage our strategic business development relationships and relationships with experienced entrepreneurs and mentors to put them in those startups to accelerate the uh, pace of growth of that startup. And we focus on always trying to have an underlying profitable business model as opposed to come up with an idea and just sell it to one of the big guys. That sounds brilliant. We love uh, revenues here at Ultralight. Um, so next we have Ed Reitler, who is uh, managing partner of Reitler, Kylas, and Rosenblatt, but also um, senior partner at, uh, or a founder at the Archangel Fund. You want to talk about those two? Sure. Uh, we are uh, the law firm, Reitler, Kylas, and Rosenblatt, uh, a uh, law firm representing early stage companies and venture funds, and uh, we've uh, we've been around for 13 years, and uh, we really enjoy working with entrepreneurs. 
And that led to the founding of Angel Round Capital, which is uh, the New York Metro's only member-led fund. So in, as opposed to an angel group, it's an actual venture fund. Uh, it's got 60 partners. We have nine portfolio companies. And we look to invest in tech-enabled services. So that would be mostly uh, ad tech, uh, uh, online advertising, lead gen, fintech, uh, health tech, and social and digital media, including uh, – Hashable, which uh, Mike next to me uh, is CEO of, and that was our actually our very first investment, and hopefully our most profitable. I hope so too. <laughs> no, no pressure. pressure. No pressure. Uh, I'm Mike Yavendidi. I'm the founder and CEO of Hashable. I'm also a partner at uh, FF Venture, which is a, a small uh, angel fund here in New York. We've done about 35 <clears throat> investments. Um, my top three investments are probably Meetup, Flurry, and uh, Clout. Clout is a uh, social influence service. We do investments across the board. We just look for really good people to invest in. Uh, people that have been in the finish line before tend to, tend to be uh, the kind of people we like to back. Fantastic. And you're CEO of Quigo. <laughs> I was. I was, was CEO of an ad tech company that was also uh, sold to AOL in, mm. in 2007. Very, um, very and I've been in the internet space since 1996. Fantastic. So founders, CEOs, and uh, early stage tech investors giving advice on, uh, on ultralight startups pitches today. Can I just make a quick point? Please do. Well, it always blows me away. I'm, I'm invited here to come and, and MC and, and help host and do timing and, and basically just kind of keep people happy. But you have the most incredible people show up. Like, I know. I well, never, I can't believe it. Happen? This is a, an amazing panel. We, we are honored to be here. And, and you'd never know it. Like, uh, just... I, I'm, I'm, I, can't, I can't even speak. I'm flabbergasted. But uh, well, thank no, you guys for coming. I, we, are, is, we are all honored. Thank you. Dave. Yes. Um, so the format here, introductions, which is what's going on right now. Um, we have 10 startups pitching. I'm pretty sure they're all here. Um, at the end of that, uh, we're going to be announcing some awards. So as I said, best pitch, the top three pitches. Um, for the first time today, uh, the top three pitches that are voted on by you get to go to New York Angels and, and go to their screening events. Uh, so that's a partnership that we just established this month. Um, and then after the awards, we go to Heartland Brewery. So this is the uh, format of the pitch. You want to talk about the, the pitch format? Absolutely. So uh, we're going to be doing two-minute pitches. Uh, oftentimes in the past we've done one minute, but this is where we've got fewer pitches, and we're, we're really focusing on you know, gleaning the, the true detail of what's going on here. We're going to get two minutes. Uh, then the panel is going to have three minutes to respond. They're going to ask questions. They're going to make some comments. They're going to be insightful, deep. Funny, witty, no pressure, uh, and uh, you know, basically, they have three minutes to to respond and, and get some more information. Then three minutes uh, where they will actually give their feedback, give the advice, and, and that's really kind of the meat of what we're here for. So, uh, two minutes, three minutes, three minutes. Uh, keep it nice and tight. Um, I'm going to try and keep you guys to 45 seconds each as you're going through your three minutes, so that uh, you know, everybody gets a chance to hear from everybody. And uh, that's pretty much it. So we'll be tight on the tight on the clock. So to vote, if you if you've picked up one of the handouts on your way in, um, it will talk about how to vote. Basically, we're using Twitter and using the hashtag Ultralight. So use pound Ultralight and then the at symbol of whoever you're voting for, and you're voting both for the pitchers and for the panelists if you think their their comments are insightful. And then we total all that up and we assign some awards afterwards. It doesn't matter what they put in their tweet that's as right. long as they've got the hashtag. That's right. Outside. So they that's can right. say, this guy is terrible, but if they've got his name in there, right. he's getting a vote. That's right. All right. That's right. <laughs> So, and don't put more than one handle on each tweet. You have to have separate tweets, otherwise it'll only count the first handle that you mentioned. Okay. Good. that's not overly confusing. The prizes, uh, $200 in Amazon Web Services credit uh, and pitch to the New York Angels. Um, and the panelist prize wins uh, the esteemed uh, award of audience choice. Audience award. choice. <laughs> it's always the most esteemed award. I'm sure that will show up high in your, in your personal CV and uh, LinkedIn. Yes, forget the millions of dollars in revenue. It's, it's odd. This is it. This is the goal. Ah, ooh, the microphone. This is my favorite slide. So uh, for those of you who have been, you all know I, I like to talk about using a microphone. Um, if you haven't been, I'll, I'll give you the same advice. Uh, when you're up here and you're pitching, if you are not comfortable with a microphone, uh, the way to think of it is that it's like an ice cream cone, right? It's delicious. You, you, you want to lick it so bad. You're up here, you're, and the tongue's, uh, and that's the rule. But don't do it. Keep it there within lick range, but don't actually lick. 
uh, and that way we'll all be able to hear you. Everybody out on Ustream will be able to hear you. Uh, one other point, uh, just keep in mind that if you're asking questions from the audience, are, are we doing any kind of audience We're participation? Audience yeah, there might too. be some audience. So when it's your turn, nobody's going to be able to hear you out in the universe except for the people in this room. So I'll be repeating questions. So if somebody has a comment or question, I will repeat it. Uh, so that is the microphone. Right. Got it. So, okay. So we'll cover the sponsors a little later. And right now, we're ready for our first, we're ready uh, for our first pitch. Okay. Just so when you're going to pitch, uh, you'll come up here, stand here-ish. This is, like, this is a good spot. Uh, you're <laughs> pitching to the panel, obviously, but you've got an audience as well. Uh, the panelists, you can all see the screen. You're all good. Excellent. Okay. Uh, and if you're on deck, if you can just wait over here so that we don't have to wait for you to come on down like the price is right. Somewhere near Sergey in the orange shirt. <laughs> Um, so Lior is first. All right. And on deck we have Ankur. Ankur, hang out next to Sergey. Okay. Uh, there you go. Get your own microphone, Tom. Thank you. Okay, give me one second to pull up your timer. All right. Can I go. go hear me? Okay. My name is Leo Messenger, and I'm the co-founder and the CTO of Medicasting. Medicasting develops a system that allows doctors to broadcast operations over the internet securely to remote peers. Surgeries are now becoming less and less invasive and more dependent on imaging devices. For example, during catheterization, a doctor would insert a catheter through some artery and uh, once inside, he would use almost exclusively looking on uh, imaging devices and less on our patients. The imaging devices would be x-ray, would be ultrasound, would be echo. Uh, he needs that to understand where the catheter is and uh, to navigate the catheter inside the patient body. We built a system that broadcasts and shares these screens with remote doctors. Our system captures all the major uh, imaging devices in the operating room. One minute. It also has two cameras and a conference call system. All that allows the doctor with one push on one button to broadcast and share the operation with a remote physician or physicians. The system was built in our own labs. It was tested in off-site uh, hospital facilities, which means medical devices are there, patients, no human patients are there. Uh, we put, in recent months, we put the system in use in uh, two major hospitals uh, here in the Northeast. Uh, and we are uh, very excited that it went so well that uh, one of them is now being routinely used to broadcast and share and practice on a new heart uh, procedure. 15 seconds. Uh, we are going to grow our business. We're going to go to small hospitals, big hospitals, operating rooms, ER clinics, wherever there are imaging devices that are used to treat patients in real time, we are going to help them do that. All right. Great. Media casting. Wow, fantastic, Lior. Questions from the panel and or from the audience? Yeah, so um, sounds like an interesting concept here. Big opportunity, sounds like. Um, talk a little bit about sort of the competitive landscape, traditional competitors and non-traditional ones. So the traditional ones, like if, if this turns out to be a huge opportunity, <laughs> then, you know, will GE just go in and, and uh, um, uh, you know, attach the video, their video devices to, to um, servers? And from the non-traditional guys, you know, the guys who are doing sort of, you know, uh, video conferencing today. Right. So basically, uh, taking a regular video conference would not cut it because uh, you need here to attach to imaging devices. It's not about cameras at all. Uh, that's one thing. Second thing about GE doing that itself, we hope that we can help them do that, actually, and, and uh, shorten the time for them. Third, about the competitive landscape as it is now, there are the traditional, I I'm, I'm, can also say mostly dinosaurs that are there, but are uh, really expensive. And we can do it much, much uh, affordable for the small hospitals, the small clinics, the, the small operating rooms. We can do that. Does this need FDA approval? And are you creating the entire end -to end system, the hardware it's, and the software? It's not a medical device, so it does not need the FDA approval. Are you providing the hardware and the software? We do. Everything and then right. Can you can you just give me an idea of uh, what your revenue model is, and uh, how you think you're going to get this product out at scale across a very long 
cell cycle with right. the hospital systems? Right, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, the revenue model is simple. You pay for the capital equipment and then a maintenance fee for the broadcasts, uh, a monthly one. And about scaling, the cell cycle is definitely long. <laughs> Uh, we scale simply by automation. So the, the system is built so that it's not, it does not need a long installation. It, does, it, it operates on one click on one button, so it's easy to scale. How were you able to build a prototype for, am I reading this right, $1,000 of monthly burn? Oh, <laughs> well, the monthly burn rate right now is uh, basically using our own funds. This is a bootstrap, a garage uh, so, so, so the answer is yes. We, can, we also utilize basically uh, development teams offshore, which uh, makes uh, it much cheaper to develop. Under my supervision, they, can, they did a great job, I have to say. Uh, we got a question in the audience as well. Yeah. Uh, who owns the content? Who owns the content? And therefore, are there privacy issues? Right. Excellent question. Uh, the content is not owned by us. We are merely the channel. Uh, the privacy issue, we have an anon anonymization system that hides every detail that needs to be hidden. There's one more question on the far back. Will there be other value to kind of end users of this, aside from just watching? Will there be additional value to other end users? This is a doctor-to-doctor -doctor system. So it's not, it's, it's the WebEx equivalent of the medical world. It's not for the public. Sorry. Okay. All right, so that's it for questions. Now we have uh, your 45 seconds yes. of helpful advice. What would you do if you're early or tomorrow? <laughs> Start with Gil. Yeah, so I think hospitals today are not looking for new things to, uh, to spend money on. They're looking at you know, less things to spend money on, mm. right? I might try to investigate what, what are some of the other business models that you can create around this. So rather than it be sort of an expenditure, maybe it's neutral or potentially revenue generating or subsidizing some other part of the business, whether it's relationships they have with educational institutions that maybe they, through grants, could pay for this or some other you know, revenue models, et cetera. So, so it sort of flips the model from and, and would probably greatly reduce the, uh, the sales cycle. Yeah, I, would, I would say my comments are uh, twofold. Number one is I look at channel partnerships to get distribution into the facilities, whether that be hardware vendors like GE or other people that are already selling into the hospital system. Secondly, off of what Gil said, is I might look to, to add an uh, educational aspect to this and then be able to create a downstream revenue by allowing students to log in and gain access and insight and medical facilities around the world. Yes, I, I, the remote delivery of medical services is such a hot area and we see so many companies trying to break into that, this would be a really useful tool to those who are selling to primary care physicians diagnostic services that could be uh, utilized by remote doctors who are specialists, neurologists, whatever. Uh, that, that seems like a really hot area and, and, and probably a shorter sales cycle. These are really tech delivery companies that, that would be interested in your services. I'd say the same thing that some of these guys said. Uh, channel partnerships, I think, are, are, a, are an obvious uh, approach to the market here. I would also talk to some, you know, some of the big hospital chains. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe some of them will invest in, 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 in what you're doing because they have a need for the technology mm -hmm. internally. Right. We got one minute left. Any other thoughts? Final insights, suggestions. If not, that's okay. Um, all right. All right. That's fine. Thanks so much, Lior. Okay. Good casting. There you go. So. Voting for Lior is a single tweet with pound ultralight and at metacasting. We'll be able to find that in your pamphlet. And you can also vote for your favorite and most insightful panelist as well. Um, so next we have Ankur and Co. with gift side story. So you want to, you're, you're driving this, right? Okay. Are you ready? It's really hard to be a good boyfriend. <laughs> you never know what to get her. Take her birthday, for example. You know it's coming up. You're not sure what to get. You think, I'll take care of it later. And so you procrastinate. And last minute, you panic. 
you're sweating, you have a panic attack, <coughs> you're sitting there scratching your head, not knowing what to do. <clears throat> well, that was me. I figured this process is really excruciating. Even though I'm married, that lovely lady over there, even I need a wingman. Welcome to Gift Size Story. Gift Size Story is a gifting concierge for men to help them find the perfect gift for women in their lives. Um, their girlfriend, their mom, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a very simple process, really. You log into the site. Um, you fill out some very basic information about her. You tell us her preferences, what she likes, what she doesn't like. What is her style like? How does she dress? Once we get this information, um, you can either buy a Just Because gift right then and there because people are used to the Amazon instant gratification model, or you can wait for our recommendation engine to send you some customized gift suggestions a few weeks before the actual event. Um, it's, it's that simple, really. We, take the, we make the process very efficient and take offload the information you have about your spouse or whoever the woman is you're buying a gift for. We take it, we process it, we do all the hard work, and you take the credit. 30 seconds. Um, this year to date, we've accomplished, we've put, put together a great team. Um, we've been live for about five weeks and have already gone over 2,000 users, 8,000 gifting events um, that are recurring. And we think this is just the beginning. Uh, from an investment standpoint, this is a very intelligent system that's incredibly scalable. Quick note on the team, uh, eight-person team, three people on the management team that are here in the room, um, incredible track record. Uh, this is, in, for two of us, our third or fourth a venture-backed startup. And for, for Jeff, our director of merchandising, who's driving over here, you know, is uh, his 20 years experience focusing on women's fashion accessories and gifting. Thank Great. you. That's time. All right. Okay, questions? Where do the recommendations come from? So uh, Jeff actually has designed a recommendation system where based on the type of input you put in, the style of the woman, what she likes, what she doesn't like, um, we, uh, the system quasi-automates the recommendations. What I mean by that is we have a merchandising grid which is populated manually, and that's where we want to keep it. We don't want it to be an algorithm through and through because that loses, this, loses the ability to personalize. But when the user picks a specific item, a uh, style of preferences, it matches that to the merchandising grid. I remember to lick your ice cream. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this has been ice cream. This is a category that no one's cracked. You know, a lot of companies have tried this. Um, you know, it, it is, you know, I don't know what the right answer is, but, uh, you know, having purely machines tell guys as, as dopey as we are um, what, to, what to buy someone is a, is a really challenging concept. And I, so do you, do you think that you will live or die based on the, 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 the quality of your algorithms? I completely agree with you. It has been done before, but it is an algorithm that's driving the results. Here, it is input from humans that are driving the selection of gifts. The automation is simply from the user On to the per transaction basis, though? I mean, every single time someone transacts with, with your engine, is there in a the human first, element? In the first two months, yes, but that's just for learning. After that, we're automating that. The point is, the gifts come from humans, but they're matched according to the preferences people put in the system. Do you agree that the best recommendation engine on the Internet right now, aside from Amazon's, you know, people that read this book ought to read this book, is Hunch? Hunch is really good, and they partnered up with Gifts.com, and we tried their wizard multiple times. And I think while Hunch is a phenomenal system, I don't think the application was done correctly. And so we are definitely learning from that, but... I think a, we think a human element is critical. But they've spent a lot of time on that decision. Tree. One minute left. <laughs> right. so, so I guess my question would be around how do, you, how do you get the feeds of relevant data, both on the taxonomy of what's relevant from products and gifting to women, as well as how do you then measure whether or not your recommendations are, are actually on point, and then how do you get at scale, which I think is what Michael's talking about, which is it's great to use the human element, but if you guys want to make this a real business, it's got to get to scale. And I think that's about real data crunching, both beforehand and then as the system gets more users. Completely agree with that. And uh, we have on every product page, there's a, there's a thumbs up, thumbs down for that product. So you can, very, you can tailor your preferences for what my wife might like, my mother-in-law might like on a product-by-product product basis, and over time, that aggregate data, along with the feedback we're getting from users actively, is going to be powerful. So what if ultimately 
the system doesn't work for your wife and uh, they want to return it. What's your policy on that? 100% money back guarantee. We'll pay for shipping both ways. Money back, no questions asked. Are you carrying okay. inventory or are you just rebuying from another? We're carrying a little bit of inventory right now, but the goal is to uh, have a fulfillment center because we have a lot of information on what people's needs are six weeks, two months, three months ahead of time. And if people can start buying earlier, we can incentivize them to buy six weeks ahead or tell us what they want. We don't need to carry inventory. So we have some for that, that guy that's panicking, that last minute, you know, I need a gift tomorrow. So we need to carry that some inventory at all times for that. But by and large, most of it will go to fulfillment. Okay. Center. So now we're into advice. So, so um, like the idea would have gotten me off the hook a number of times here. <laughs> um, don't like the, the data source which is me entering uh, the data there. So you show you know, pictures of four women there. I'm either going to do one of two things. Is I'm going to pick the hottest woman in there and say, yeah, that's my wife, right? right? <clears throat> or I'm going to sort of be aspirational and say, I wish you would wear that, right? What, right? what style is she? I have no idea of those, uh, of those styles there, right? So, so just hold on one second. So let me just make a little suggestion here, right? Ask me for my Facebook ID. Go on all my, my Facebook photos. Find the photos of my wife and see what she actually wears and take it from there. A quick response to that? Very quick. We're creating a platform to allow women to put their own preferences in and then email their boyfriend or husband. Here, I did the inputting. So I don't get any okay. credit for that then. Right? I want to get credit that I thought of this gift on my own and it is so awesome and perfect. Nine out of ten women love our concept. Okay. Okay, so Brad. I, I think... Uh, I think my biggest piece of advice would be focus. So you're talking about doing very, very high-level matching, trying to, to match things together. You're also talking about holding your own inventory, doing fulfillment, all sorts of other things that I think distract you from what Michael was talking about, which is a very, very hard problem to solve. I also think you need to figure out how to crunch massive amounts of data from Facebook and from trends going on in Us Weekly and the rest of the general you know, social population as opposed to user input and your own curation. I, I, I like it. I, I, <laughs> I think I'm going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> you still have to give practical advice. What would you tell them to do tomorrow? I would, I would kill the consumer destination idea. I don't think you're going to, I don't think you're going to get enough people to come to this site and, and fill out the information that you want them to fill out. You need to go where the users are. I would relaunch this thing as a Facebook app. I would put it within the environment uh, where you can do incredible targeting, right? I would think of this as a, as, a, as a Zynga game, right? Think about the incredible targeting that you can do if you live within Facebook's environment and the app lived within Facebook's environment. I think you have a much better chance of, of, of selling this service to, to guys that are hanging out in Facebook than you do in driving people to your site. I, I think that's where people fall down. It's, it's not only the algorithm, but it's you have to also match a great algorithm with a lot of foot traffic to your site. You're just never going to do both things. Yeah, I would, just one last thing to add, which is I've seen a whole bunch of interesting startups that are focused on doing this at the merchant site. So providing layers of data to help the merchant refine the experience for whoever through the, the discovery and the, and the checkout process, it's actually along the signs of what Mike's saying, which is totally leave the consumer-facing side and actually use what you're saying is the secret sauce, the matching, and then sell that to the merchants directly, leverage the other network of data, and then you can actually put the recommendations directly into merchants. All right. That's Thank all we have you. time for. Great. Right. Awesome. Okay. Give side story. Thank you, Anka. Thank you, Jeff. So to vote, it's always good. Um, to vote for Encore it and Gift Side Story, it's at Gift Side Story. Fortunately, they were able to get their uh, Twitter handle. Um, pound Ultralight at Gift Side Story and vote for your panelists uh, as well. Whoever was the most insightful. Next, we have Derek Webster of Local Bonus up and on deck Edward Valentini, uh, who's going to making his way to the front. So whenever you're ready, Derek. So I love local businesses and I love rewards programs, but today something's broken when you try and combine the two. So when you go into a coffee shop or another local business, they probably give you a buy 10, get one free punch card. And so you end up with a wallet full of punch cards. You've got a couple stamps here, a couple stamps there. You're never really getting an award. 
and the merchant has no real way of communicating with you and building a relationship. Uh, we're trying to solve that by letting you use your existing credit or debit card as your loyalty card at local businesses uh, and giving merchants an easy way to launch a rewards program. So as a consumer, you sign up once on our site. It's completely free, and you can use your existing card. Whenever you use that at Merchants in Our Network, you automatically earn 10 points per dollar, and you save up those points towards free stuff at Merchants in Our Network. For merchants, it's an easy way to communicate with their customers. It's an easy way to provide rewards to them for their service. Uh, There's no point-of-sale integration required on their side, no employee training uh, required as well. Uh, We launched two months ago. Uh, We've grown to 25 merchants since then. Uh, We're looking to use a seed round to build out a sales team to continue to grow that. You have one minute. And uh, our business model is basically that when people earn points at a merchant, the merchant will pay in uh, for that. That's our revenue. Uh, When you redeem for free stuff, we'll pay the merchant out for that. Uh, We can make money two ways on this. The first is making a spread on that. So merchant pays us more when points are earned than when they're redeemed. Uh, The second way is just breakage. Points may be earned that are never redeemed. So in frequent flyer miles, that's 20%. In uh, credit card points-based programs, it's closer to 50%. Uh, In terms of the team, I'm the founder and CEO. I have a Stanford MBA. I ran credit card product development for E-Trade, ran a rewards program for them there, Uh, and most recently was at Oliver Wyman advising large retail banks on uh, their payments and loyalty strategy. We have a CTO with 12 years of development experience. He ran a team uh, that built Australia's largest Ruby on Rails uh, project. Uh, We have a sales rep with 18 years of local sales experience. Uh, and a Harvard uh, graduate who uh, has worked for a mobile networking startup managing their social media. So we think we've got a great product for consumers, great product for merchants, and the right team to build a business around that. All right. Great. Okay, questions. Is the, is the plan to stay local until you figure out how things work? So even for the 25 merchants we signed up, almost all those are concentrated in downtown Manhattan because we want to build that base and that density of merchants. And we think if we can solve that problem, then you just have to replicate that in other markets. Uh, and so that's where you know, we expand from there to other parts of Manhattan, other boroughs, and ideally to other cities. Let's work back. Ed, we're going to go right, right to left this time. Sure. I mean, how are, what is the plan to acquire the, 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 uh, the users, the consumers? How, how, what is your consumer acquisition plan? So uh, right now it's mostly in-store collateral at the merchants. So if you go to Luke's Lobster next to the register, you should see a little sign that says earn free lobster rolls here with the local bonus logo and the uh, Luke's logo. So that way most of our initial mer- uh, consumers are loyal to or have some affinity to merchants in our network. Um, if you live in San Francisco, our product isn't particularly useful to you because you don't earn or burn at any of the merchants in our network. So it's primarily... Uh, promotions and in-store signage at merchants. Um, as we build up that density, we'll start to bring in our own network of consumers as well, but we're waiting until we have enough merchants so that that has an ROI behind it. Are you having trouble getting the merchants' attention? They're getting so many local deals, uh, salespeople or you know, stay-at-home uh, parents yep. or part-time workers coming in and selling various types of rewards products. So there is a lot of noise because of the daily deals model, and there's so many daily deal sites out there selling to them. Once you get through to a decision maker and you explain that this is about loyalty, this is about getting customers to come back and repeatedly make purchases and then giving them an award at the end as opposed to giving them a massive discount and then keeping your fingers crossed that they come back and as everyone's learning, they actually don't. Um, So once we actually have the chance to communicate that message, um, merchants are receptive to it and we're... We're deliberately taking a very pro-merchant stance to all of our business policies because part of the whole shakeout that's occurring right now in the daily deal industry is because it's not sustainable for merchants. Um, I will say there is some noise there. Yeah, so a couple of thoughts, which is, uh, you know, I, I agree. I think the local space is really crowded, and I think being able to get a little bit of traction is okay, but you need to build two, two networks. You need to build your audience of consumers and your audience of merchants, which is very, very difficult to do. So I might want you guys to focus on one or the other and figure out how I would partner to then augment the other audience. I think the other thing that is a little bit concerning is I don't really like when part of the primary business model is breakage because breakage is a variable that changes over and over again and doesn't really seem to add the underlying value that you're trying to drive. So I would, you know, examine how, ex- how you can adjust that maybe. On, on the first point, we're focused on the merchant side primarily at this point, and that's where we spend a majority of our time and efforts because we're hoping that that will lead to users. Obviously, we want to pour on additional users and user marketing as we go, but for right now, it's merchant acquisition is our primary focus. Um, what was your second point? Sorry. Uh, 
What was my second point? The break, oh, break, yeah, break. The breakage. So, yeah, right now, I mean, we still do make a profit as it's priced now on the spread. Um, we think that breakage could be an additional business model. We obviously aren't relying on it. So our cost of redemptions is less than what we charge merchants uh, on point earning. But okay, so we, so think, we think it's gravy. Let's start with Gil for feedback. We're into our yep. feedback time. Yep. Absolutely. So um, hmm. like, the, like the model here, two big questions, and I'll put my, my, my venture hat on for, for a moment here. And, and one is a capital efficiency and, uh, and, 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 and sort of defensibility, right? So love local. Uh, we spend 90% of our income within probably a mile of where we live there. Uh, but it's a dirty, ugly business, trench warfare. You need you know, feet on the street to close these businesses, right? So can you run this business in a capital efficient way? You know, on you know, the million that you're raising or a couple of million dollars, or is this something that you're really going to need to raise tens of million dollars, right? Second thing is, um, it's great that you have a, a presence in, in, in Manhattan, and even if you own Manhattan, that could be an interesting business, but you really want to be able to go national on, on this year. How do you go from market to market, and how do you maintain a competitive advantage? So if I invest a dollar um, in your business um, for, for, you know, for, from an investment point of view in New York, right, um, how, do, how do you turn that into sort of requiring 75 cents for Chicago, 50 cents for LA, and 25 cents for every market there is. And if anybody else wants to enter that market, they start at the dollar and you'll have a way ahead. So how do you figure out what is, what is that template for creating, turning your business to more of a, of a sales manufacturing business? Okay. Right. Um, I would say uh, I like the business. I love everything local. But I think you need to look at the defensibility. So what stops one of the credit card companies from saying all of their merchants, hey, everybody that takes this MasterCard, we'll put you in a loyalty program and we'll give you 25 basis points off your fees. So I think number one is they're already in the merchant, so figure out defensibility. I think the other thing is this sounds to me more like you should find a strategic partner to help get the scale and the capital efficiency that Gil was talking about. Otherwise, I just don't think on a million dollars you're going to get to a point where the business is is that interesting. That's, that's I think, the, the, the most challenging thing about the model is at ARC we've seen about 20 local deals and rewards companies. I was just at our evaluation company last night, and we saw two of six companies in the space, all with different twists, and, and, and a lot of them are very thoughtful and creative, and this is as well. I like the model a lot. I think Gil mentioned it. One of the challenges is doing this in a way, get, getting a venture fund, getting ARC or any other fund to part with their money. We're all going to worry about how soon we're going to have to re-up and how much money it's going to take for you to get to cover your G&A and, 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 and uh, be a sustainable business without us having to continue to feed the subsequent rounds. Part of that might be with a creative business model. I encourage you to look uh, at the Columbia Business School study on a company called Vet Insurance, which was backed by um, Mavron out of Seattle a well-known consumer um, venture finance firm where they had a very creative model for sales reps and how they compensated them. A lot of these were part-time. Uh, having some creative model that, that is actually uh, something that a, a venture fund is going to understand and get their arms around and want to support would be what I would suggest. All right. Mike, very quick. We're, we're, we're out of time, but go, go quick. Manhattan's a tough market. I mean, you have a gigantic chicken and egg problem. A really, really hard market. It's kind of scary. Um, but, you know, I would look at a middle, sort of a, a mid-market town where something like the hotel industry is really dominant. They become massive conduits of economic activity in small and medium-sized, especially in small and medium-sized cities. There's a lot of people coming through hotels and, uh, and fanning out into local businesses, restaurants, uh, and uh, rental car companies and that sort of thing. Maybe some sort of partnership between a major hotel chain and uh, the merchants in, in, in a particular city could, could be the thing that ignites this. Awesome. Thank you. All right. That's all the time. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. So to vote, voting for local bonus is at local bonus, pound, pound ultralight, and the hash, uh, I'm sorry, pound ultralight, and at local bonus. Uh, and then vote for your panelists as well. So next up, we have Edward Valentini of Nelby on deck, John Federico. So whenever you're ready, go ahead, Edward. Currently, the process of finding a home is extremely inefficient and causes severe anxiety for buyers, renters, and brokers alike. We have spent the last couple of years thinking about this at Nelby, and we have invented a, an innovative way to completely streamline this process. Let me tell, tell you a little bit about Nelby. 
With Nelby, customers can schedule showings instant and confirmed, just the same way they make reservations on open table. Nelby has additional magic on the back end that, allows the, that qualifies the customer and delivers ready and willing and able customers to brokers, for which brokers pay a minimum fee. I'm Edward Valentini, CTO and co-founder of Nelby. I have 15 years of software development experience. My co-founder, Mike McGrath, um, has 10 years of sales and management experience in the real estate industry. This is a multi-billion dollar industry with no precise solution, and Nelby steps in to give customers the immediate call to action they want and lets brokers know how much you can afford and how soon you'll buy. It's almost as if Open Table were to tell the restaurant, well, it were to tell the restaurant what the customer wants to eat and how much they're willing to spend. So far, we've bootstrapped and raised small amount, small amounts in a friends and family round. We launched in beta in July. We already have about 100 brokers using our site and growing daily. We're looking to raise a seed round that would help us um, build out our sales team, make some key hires, and um, go nationwide within 12 months. Investors, if you're interested in discussing an investment opportunity, please feel free to contact me. You guys out there in the audience, please check out our site and vote for And don't forget to vote for us. Thank you. Fabulous. All right. Ahead of time. Okay. Thanks, Questions? So what, what's the problem that solves? The problem that this solves is that, so from our research, the customer's biggest problem is that there's no call to action. It's the problem of, of, of not being able to contact a broker. 46% of the time, if you contact a broker, they never get back to you. Um, that's on the customer side. On the broker side, the, big, the problem is they get inundated with, with emails and voicemails, and they don't know who's viable and who's not. So we have a special scoring algorithm we can figure out. Um, essentially, we, we rate people from 0 to 100 on what's their, like how, how soon they're willing to buy or rent and how much they're willing to spend. So, so it looks like your, your business model is really based on arbitrage between cost of acquisition and cost of selling the lead. Right, exactly. Okay. So the problem with pure arbitrage is, A, you've got to maintain that price in the cost of acquisition, and, B, you have to both grow the inventory of, of retailers or realtors as well as the customer base. So how do you plan to do that? Right. It's, a, it's like the chicken and egg problem you were talking about before. On the broker side, we use direct sales um, to contact the brokers and get them signed up with us. On the customer side, we um, have a two-pronged approach. One is a traditional Google AdWords, and the other is we plan to uh, develop a widget, um, which we which we'd like to have on other real estate sites. So you could be on um, Trulia or Zillow, and you could see a schedule it with Nelby button and be able to schedule it not from, not even from our site, from third-party sites. Oh, but Trulia is not going to let you, Trulia is not going to want you to drive leads to realtors on their, on their site. That's their business. They're, they, they, they want credit for those leads. They're not going to let you... Uh, get in, in between their their customer and the broker. So how are you going to get... So what's the value proposition for the consumer? You're, I'm going to use your service... One because, minute, one minute. Because you're going to help me for the precisely consumer, schedule something? I don't, under, I don't really... Yeah, you can, you can... It's real-time scheduling. We do all the regulatory stuff that when you, when you see a property, you have to sign some um, agency disclosure agreements. We do everything online. You can do a credit check with us online. We eventually hope to you know, do mortgage, uh, pre -mor mortgage pre-qualifications online, and you can schedule at the time that you want to see it. Is, is this for instant. New York City or everywhere else? We launched in beta in, in New York City alone, but we hope to go nationwide in 12 months. Quick question from the audience. Uh, this sounds like a mobile app. Yeah, we're... we're is we're, there we're a mobile the, app? Uh, currently, there is no mobile app, but we're in the process of developing it. So... so um, my, my big question here is really how easy would it be uh, to replicate something like this, right? Maybe less the, you know, the, the, the algorithm in the middle to rate the, you know, the customers and all, but if there is, in fact, an arbitrage between what you can pay for somebody, you know, to Brad's point, on AdWords that you pay $3 for somebody, and then you can convert that person with, you know, with forms and all, you know, for lead gen to, to realtors at, at $30, mm. right? Um, or maybe you can sell it three times and it's a 1 to 10 you know, conversion ratio or something like that. If there's an arbitrage there, 
and you introduce this model here, how quickly can somebody say, oh, an arbitrage opportunity, we're going to get in there, and then the $3 goes to 4 5 10 you know, et cetera. And, 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 so, and, and also what realtors would pay might go down or what have you. So how do you build some defensibility in the business? Aside from the, you know, the matching algorithm, I'm not sure exactly how much value that, that adds there. How do you build defensibility around the business? Or is this yeah. the, the so now, now or you're, or in, the, well, we've kind of gone past question time. So now you're into right, so, so, reforming your question as a statement. As a statement here, <laughs> right, right. So, so what I would look at is really how do we build defensibility uh, around this business here? Okay. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm still unclear on what the secret sauce is and, and why, why this is going to change the real estate market. So I think... You know, it's interesting if you can give fully qualified scheduled appointments to properties directly to realtors and basically sell them a person that's coming to see the property. Um, It's unclear to me what else is going on. So I think you really need to drill down in in what the value proposition is to both the realtor and to me, the consumer. Because right now, I think I can pick up the phone, call a realtor. If I want to look at a $3 million piece of property... I'm not going to have a problem getting a call back. Yeah, we, we represent the company in the travel space that tried to assemble a, um, uh, a, a list of travel agents to sell bids to. And uh, one, one of the challenges in that company was back, venture back here in the city and, and eventually didn't make it. It just didn't have a robust enough group of, of travel agents that were willing to, to bid in the system to make the, to make the, uh, the bids competitive. And here, I would worry, you mentioned that you've got a direct sales method of going after the, the brokers. That, like so many of the other things we've talked about today, is just hard work. It's, it's a slog. It takes a lot of money to build that type of force to go out and one-on-one call. In your current model, you have a $75 fee for these brokers to access the platform. And I think a lot of these brokers, it's going to be hard to get them to, to write a check or to, to hit their, uh, their credit card every month or annually or whatever you want to do to get the right to then bid on leads that they have no idea how valuable or, or how, how relevant they are. They, 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 they have to trust that your algorithm is going to work. That, that's a tough, I think that's a tough model. Okay. Mike? Yeah, I would think hard about trying this in a different market other than New York. New York's really hard. I was an early advisor to Street Easy uh, five or six years ago, who's been one of the, the really few uh, companies to, to emerge as successful in the New York City market, but they did it with a very key point of differentiation, right? They had data on previous sales data that no one else had, and and so if you really want to if you want to buy an apartment in New York City, you have to you have to use Street Easy now. They just they've made that 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 leap. By the way, five years ago they launched, they still haven't gotten out of New York City. All right, that's time. Right, thank you. Thanks, everyone. So voting for Nelby is. Uh, Pound Ultralight and at Nelby News. Um, next up, we have John Federico, and on deck uh, after the break is going to be James. So, uh, John. <coughs> Seth. You ready? Yes, yeah, all right. All right. <laughs> it's good. Go, do it. Good evening, everyone. I'm John Federico, and this is my co-founder, Clement Mamakin, and together, we're curious. Uh, We've created a service that ensures that the time, money, and effort that you spend attending professional conferences and events, just like this one, is fully maximized. We like to tell people that curious, it's kind of like LinkedIn meets Foursquare and a little eHarmony thrown in for good measure. And uh, keep that in mind while I explain the problem by example. Last week, I attended a professional event. My goal while I was there was to meet as many prospective customers, partners, and investors as I possibly could. I met some great people. I had some excellent conversations. But at the end of the night, I failed to achieve my goals. Sound familiar? Uh, And that's really just because the process of meeting people at conferences and events is purely random. Um, Curious solves this problem using our real-time people matching engine and cross-platform smartphone application. Here's how it works. We integrate with the world's most popular event registration systems. So we simply just become part of the registration process. When you arrive at your event, you check in using the Curious app, uh, just like you would using something like Foursquare. Um, And we immediately uh, present to you a group of people that we believe you should meet based on the information you provided us at registration, 
uh, your existing social graph, along with some other signals that we track. For event organizers, Curious is a system for the acquisition and retention of attendees, exhibitors, and sponsors. Wouldn't you attend more events if you knew you'd need more of the right people? 30 seconds. Of course you would. The basic service is free to organizers and attendees. Uh, for organizers, we plan to offer premium services that help them grow their top-line sponsorship revenue, uh, as well as streamline their registration. For attendees who want to spend just a few more dollars to meet even more of the right people, uh, we have what we uh, internally call a business model. We call it AdSense for People. Um, you can probably guess how that works. If you can't, I'm happy to talk about it over beers at Heartland uh, after the event. Um, we appreciate any feedback you have, and please, of course, take a moment to vote for Curious. Thank you. Perfect. Great timing. All right. Okay. So, questions from the panel? Yeah, so as an investor, I'm seeing tons of these kinds of, you know, hey, Jim, you ought to meet Bob. Hey, Bob, you ought to meet Jim kind of apps. And I, in order to remain intellectually consistent, I find some of them a little bit creepy. Um, how do you avoid the, the creepiness factor? Like if someone, you know, if I got some sort of notification on my phone that, you know, some random person was like beating a path to, to, to come after me in some <laughs> conference, I would think it was a little bit weird and strange. I kind of like the randomness of, of meetings. How do, you, how do you avoid that? How do you make it so that it actually is constructive and both people on both sides feel like it's constructive. Sure. Uh, we've put a lot of thought into our product strategy, and, and do I say it all the time? The creepy factor is always something that we've discussed. <laughs> um, and when you're, at a, when you're at a professional event, the social norms change, right? It's expected that if I want to meet this young man right here, that I'm going to go chase him and say hello and say, introduce myself, right? And that's okay. If I do that out on the street on 6th Avenue, that's not okay. Um, so... It's about, for us, it's about context, and that's where we're focused right now on only professional conferences and events. Because, but does does he know that you're coming after him? Does well, he, he may not. But we're in a perfectly safe environment, one would say, surrounded by you know a hundred people. But but the reality is that make, introducing myself in an event like this, people come to network, and that's right. that's a given uh, social norm at something like this, and that's yeah. why we're focused here first. Okay. So, how do you handle the the issue of? You may want to meet that person, right? You're a salesman. I'm looking for customers, right? That would be the perfect customers. And the other guy, maybe not wanting to meet you uh, or wanting to sort of filter who they want to meet, right? So a potential customer, you know, let's say you know, a CIO, would not want to meet with you know, Oracle and IBM and, and all these guys. I'm sure they want to meet with it. Maybe he specifically wants to meet you know, somebody else. Is there a way for them to match only when... Each of them want to meet each other? So how do we ensure that the match is wanted on both sides? Um, yes, we, um, uh, to start, of course, the simple way to do that would be to, to constrict the data that you put in your profile. Going forward, uh, there'll be what we call, for lack of a better term, a block list. And so you can say, you know what, I don't want to talk to salespeople. And so you can, anyone who uh, introduces himself on their profile as a salesperson you can just say, I, I'm not interested so the in that. salespeople are not going to put that in their profile. Uh, well, that's very possible. Yeah, that's very possible. Sure, you can also enlist your phone okay. number and, yeah, well, I mean, there are lots of things you can do. 30 seconds. A 24-year-old so. looking for a drink. That's what I'm talking about. One more quick question. Is there more yes. just like, I want to use the app, it's just a way to tip me off as to who's there and why, and, 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 and who, who are the subset of people that I might be interested in meeting? Is that really what it does? Yes, based on the information you've provided. And Brad, you're, you're itching. Well, I mean, I think it is a little creepy, and I think the, the problem is is that the ones that are getting seeked out often don't want to get seeked out, or they have a, an agenda of people that they want to meet with. People are, that are you are, transitioning into advice now? Uh, so my advice. My, my advice would be that I, I think it's more interesting if you can – bring it ahead of the actual networking event. So if I register for SES and somewhere in the two to four weeks before SES, there's some sort of process where it says, hey, do you want to meet with these people? These are people that indicated they want to meet with you and allow it to help me schedule my time. That becomes way more interesting to me than, you know, me and Mike having to run away from a bunch of people stalking us. <laughs> Good right. feedback. And we can do that. Okay, uh, wait. We're, we're, we're in listening mode. Still, okay, so now, Ed. What do you do? I, I guess I, would, I haven't heard about when there's an imbalance in, in the room. In the, in, it's kind of assuming so far that 
there's a group of people and they want to get together in a room. But often in a conference like a venture conference, there's an imbalance. There's a few investors and many entrepreneurs, and the entrepreneurs all want to talk to the investors. What is? I guess I would try and think about the utility or how to use the product in, in that circumstance where there's such a great imbalance that the investors are basically just trying to get to the door by the end of the night. Okay. Mike? Yeah, I think, I think you got to think really hard about, A, how to differentiate yourself uh, from, because there are so many companies purporting to do something similar to this, as you know. Uh, you got to figure out how to differentiate yourself. And I think maybe doing something uh, that precedes the event, that sort of more formalizes the, the process of, uh, you know, person A getting, getting in contact with person B, maybe like plan, plan cast is sort of a service where people in advance of going to an event announce the fact that they're going to an event. Maybe there's some way to say, hey, I'm interested in meeting these five people, and somehow that gets communicated in a way that at least let, allows me to react to it if I want to react to it. I think that, would, might, that might differentiate you, and it also may feel a little more natural. You've got to think really hard about how do human beings really interact with each other, and how do the people sort of at the top of the pyramid want to be interacted with? Yep. So I would, I would worry about sort of the cricket factor, right, w- which is, you know, the, the, you have the app, and there's nobody around. There's nobody to meet because nobody else has, has downloaded it or, or, or what have you. you know, how do you really get over that, that, that critical mass problem here where, yes, totally agree, big conference, everybody has signed up, there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of way to filter and match people up, um, but I, I worry about sort of that, that out-of-box experience of so the guy who, who, you know, installs it and, you know, no matches found. The, the dreaded cold start problem. Right, especially for social networks. And in fact, I guess I'm shooting myself this way, but it's good to be truthful. It's even worse for a business like this because, like a social network, you sign up, nobody's there. What happens? You don't go back. Right. Well, this. You, so oh, okay. imagine having that compounded. Okay. Well, we're we're. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'd love to talk to you about it later. Thank, Thank you. you. More more over drinks. That's yeah. that's where this that's where the good stuff happens. Excellent. Thanks, John. Um, so. How do we vote for it? Voting for Curious. I am curious as to how one would vote for Curious. Uh, it is Curious App. That's Q-R-I-O-U-S-A-P-P. These people can't spell. Curious. Don't you know how to spell? I'm not sure I would be able to spell it the right way either, for that matter. Um, so now we'll just um, thank our sponsors. Ooh, how, sponsors. How about that? Yes. They make it possible. So I would say at least two of these companies are going to be in the room. I'm not at all confident that Amazon is. Um, is Carlos or Peter Rothberg here? I see, I see them both. How about Peter? And then Carlos, you can make your way up. You want to say a little something about Art Lercalis and Rosenblatt? Welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to again take center stage. Oh, take center stage. Okay. <laughs> it's great to be here to. Sponsor again, uh, Ultralight Startups. Uh, every every time it gets better and better, the room gets more and more full. The companies get more interesting, and uh, we're really glad to be able to sponsor this event. We are a uh, law firm, a boutique law firm that specializes in representing emerging growth companies and companies all the way through to their to their growth phases. We represent venture funds. Uh, we do all kinds of financings. And we are very fortunate to have seen many of our clients move from uh, $100,000 fundings in the, in the beginning of their lives to $150 million exits. And we're with them all the way through, and that's how we like to be. And it's also very nice to see some clients out in the audience, and uh, uh, some of my partners are also here Ed's on the panel, and there's some other partners here back in the room. And we'd love to talk to anybody that wants to talk to us about any way that we can help you. So... That's great. Thank you. All right. Thank Wonderful. you. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, and Carlos is our ch- chaperone here from Microsoft. Uh, did he, I thought he just raised his hand. So, yeah, make your way up if you want. Uh, normally it's Summit. Summit is, uh, is uh, flooded in, if you can believe it. I, still, I believe it's still Irene-driven. Wow. Um, 
So he can't make it today, and Carlos is standing in, so he's going to talk about... Not that I have much to talk about. Uh, yeah, okay, lick your ice cream and stand up front. Oh, yeah, sorry. I licked the ice cream. Here we go. Just thank you all very much for coming. Obviously, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. The sorts of things you guys are doing obviously inspire us, right? It's not just about the software. It's about how it's used. So, really, thank you all very much for coming here. Hope to keep seeing you here. I expect Microsoft will be sponsoring and letting you guys come here for a long time. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, I'm pretty sure there's nobody from Amazon here. And, and let me just – actually, I'm going to just say one more thing about BizSpark just because for people who don't know, what they do is they allow you to utilize their software for free during your startup phase. So in a nutshell, uh, you get hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of value, and it's a fabulous thing. So, um, also, Amazon. Let me talk about Amazon. So built upon the same world-class technology that powers Amazon.com, Amazon Web Services provides a reliable, easy-to-scale, low-cost cloud computing offering. Startups and companies of all sizes around the globe use AWS to power a wide variety of web applications, uh, including social gaming, mobile, e-commerce, media and entertainment, life sciences, and much more. To learn more, stay in touch. Check them out at aws.amazon.com. All right, so we love Amazon, and they are sponsoring uh, prizes, right? We get $200 for the top pitches. That is exactly right. Uh, Money, money, money. I love it. Deep pockets. Got to love friends with deep pockets. With that said, James uh, is up and Phaedra is on deck. Oops, it's not on. Testing. Testing. There you go. All right. All right. Fire away. All right. My name is James Sadie, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Automato. Um, we're an early stage software company developing the first and only data integration platform built inside of Google Chrome. We help non-technical people work faster online by connecting data to web applications, data from spreadsheets, data from APIs, and we're working on other uh, unstructured formats like email. So what does this mean specifically? If you work in a company that uses software to manage its business, there's a 99% chance that someone is wasting time entering data into software. Um, It's one of the most common technology problems in business. Software applications don't talk to each other. Um, And the result uh, for millions of people is uh, manual work. The existing companies and solutions uh, that solve this problem uh, today are at the IT level. They're very expensive. They require technical expertise. Um, we designed something for non-technical people. Um, um, it solves the problem where the pain is felt at the end user level. Um, so Automato is built inside the browser, uh, which makes it compatible with any workflow uh, and uses simple drag-and-drop functionality that anyone can use. Um, Within the idea that within minutes, um, someone can uh, install our application uh, with zero engineering skills and interact with an API and move data across the cloud. Um, so I'm a big fan of showing uh, and not telling. So I wanted to um, run the demo, which is already running. Um, so you see here we're moving data from a spreadsheet into a Facebook ad platform. You can literally draw on top of web pages to connect the data from the source to the web application. And that's it. Okay, great. Awesome. So we have three minutes of questions from the panel. We'll start with Gil. So if I use wait, wait, Mike, we're going to start with Gil. We'll come back to you. Um, So so I'm a technologist at heart. I love technology. Sounds like really cool technology, right? Now let me take off my technologist hat and put my sort of average Joe user hat on. How do I know I need this? How do I know what to do with it? How do I know what problems it solves? Um, and how do I find you and to, you know, to know that I, I can solve it with you? Yeah, so um, we're still early stage and we're figuring a lot of this stuff out. Um, we, uh, you know, the product solves problems for small businesses as well as the largest companies. So, um, you know, one of our strategies is being inside the SaaS app integration, you know, partnering, uh, integration partnerships and getting inside of the ecosystems of applications like Salesforce and FreshBooks um, where these people are, you know, have, have the problem. Um, uh, with bigger companies, like, I think enterprise direct sales is definitely needed um, the, to attack what, you know, the homegrown app market. Um, medium and bigger companies develop these uh, sort of proprietary uh, web applications all the time, especially uh, when you have mergers and acquisitions, acquisition situations. Um, they need temporary uh, ways to connect systems. Um, right. It's a pretty deep answer. 
All right. Yeah. So I guess my questions would be, uh, so, you know, what exactly is the business model around revenue and the recurring? Is it a, a regular SaaS model or is there some hybrid model? And then I would also say that we're seeing a tremendous amount of deals um, that are leveraging the cloud infrastructure to change the way people connect data. You know, I, I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, why do you integrate directly with a Chrome browser and why is that your strategy as opposed to another strategy? So for the revenue model, um, we see this as a freemium uh, application, uh, charging customers from, from little as $5 a month all the way to $50 a month. Uh, we want to build an enterprise version to uh, help people inside of bigger companies uh, sort of handle these more complex data uh, applications. Um, in terms of uh, Google Chrome, it was... Uh, it's the most sophisticated browser. JavaScript engine is amazing. The things you can do inside of Google Chrome um, were, were farther advanced, and we found it the easiest to develop. Um, I worked at Google for about six and a half years, so uh, obviously I had some connections there, and it just felt like the most comfortable place for us to start, but uh, definitely have plans to move into Firefox and other browsers. Okay. We only have 30 seconds left, so... Who's your target uh, audience? Is it the SMB market that doesn't have internal IT departments, or are you looking to sell to larger enterprises? Uh, both. Uh, we said huge opportunities in both. Uh, small companies can't afford uh, engineers uh, to interact with APIs. Uh, larger companies, uh, small teams, small pockets of teams don't get the engineering resources to do this stuff. It's amazing how, uh, inside of Google, how many people spent uh, time on manual data entry. If you're a heavy Google Apps user, is this an enhancement or a competitor? If you're a heavy Google Apps, it's absolutely an enhancement. Uh, it takes, uh, it, it turns your Google Spreadsheets application into um, so, uh, sort of extending the interface uh, and connecting it to the web. Okay. All right. Now time for comments. So um, a little bit related to my, to my first comment there is I would uh, package up. Um, a predefined set of these connections for popular applications and to allow the average Joe to solve a very specific problem that, that they might have. The advanced user then may have an ability, or after they get familiar with this package, that, this package of features and functions, what have you, then they can maybe go behind the curtain and do all the, all the connecting. Yeah, um, so I would say mine is uh, two-part. Number one, I would focus more. I think I would, I would not focus on the enterprise level right away. I would smoke a, focus on the SMB market, and I would echo what um, Gil said, which is I would create some use case scenarios, prepackage those use case scenarios, tie your revenue model to that, and grow your user base on a very, very defined path, and then expand the business out of that. I like the application idea as well. Uh, I think it gives people more of a concrete sense of what you're doing. But also, I do everything. I would go to the SMB market, too, because I would worry that the IT departments in the large enterprise sales, first of all, it's a long sales cycle, but second, that they would be disintermediated in this process of data leaving their companies, and they'd feel like a loss of control. You're going to have to navigate that at some point when you crack that market. It would be easier to make more progress, get more traction, more likely to attract capital once you have progress at the SMB level. I would make it more accessible. I think that's the obvious uh, challenge, I think, with, uh, with what you're doing right now. The average business person uh, that works at you know some some middle level position in some midwestern company is not using Chrome, yeah. and and so you know you're you're locking yourself out of the market. I would think your service as I mean the genius of something like Evernote, which is not very similar, but is similar in that I think what they've done that's amazing is they've made it incredibly accessible, and you need to make this incredibly accessible. So yeah, Chrome was definitely just sort of experimenting in. Sure. Out the technology. Great. Okay, that's feedback. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, James. So, voting for James is uh, at Automato Team, A U T O M A T O Team, and Pound Ultralight. So, next up we have Phaedra, and on deck we have Gene DeRose. Phaedra? Uh, you want to drive it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Oh. Maybe a little too close. No, that's good. We, we, voice of God. Do it. Uh, my name is Fedra, and I'm here to share the story about our company, Daily Secret. Oh. Which, is, <laughs> which is coming oh, up. Oh, we lost no. that internet connection. Well, I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, my co-founder and I, Nikos, uh, started Daily Secret 
in probably what's the least business-friendly city in the entire world today, and that's Athens, Greece. Um, we started Daily Secret during the middle of the Greek crisis to remind Athenians what they love about their city. This initial, initial Good Karma project became a real company um, when we reached 50,000 members in Athens. And we've, one year later, we've expanded to six cities across four continents and published in four languages. So what exactly are we to warrant this popularity? We are a daily email platform that sends you one stunning email every day containing a secret about your city. Secrets can be anything from a restaurant without a sign to a hidden park within, within the city. Um, from Mexico City, which was our last uh, city edition that we launched, to Shanghai, we're unlocking the relationship between these booming, emerging cities around the world and the people that, they, that love them. We're taking our own journey around the world and launching one city a month, uh, and we're actively fundraising to make that happen. And I'll let you guys check out the site. Uh, we've expanded to, right now we have Athens, Istanbul, San Francisco, Lima, uh, Shanghai, Mexico City. We have Berlin coming up in September, uh, Paris and Barcelona, October, November, and have about another 15 cities in the pipeline. And fundraising will make will expedite this process. Okay, yeah. great questions for Daily Secrets. Uh, let's start with Mike. He loves starting. Well, I didn't bring my checkbook, but I'm very interested in what you're doing. I actually think you have cracked one really important nut. I think I haven't seen your content, but I will presume that it's really good. Um, <laughs> and and I think the thing that you've cracked it, you made me want to open it and read it. And everyone in this room hates email, hates spam, hates, hates commercial email, um, the Groupons and all those sorts of things I delete automatically. Um, but this is something that is intriguing. And so I think I want, actually want to look at it, uh, especially if, it's, if, if, if the content is tailored to where I live, if it's some, some secret nugget of information every day about New York City. I've lived in New York City for more than 20 years. I'm interested. Great. I'm going to read it, I think, a lot more frequently than I do other similar type emails. So I think that's I think that's a great accomplishment. That's great to hear. We actually have an open rate of about thirty eight percent. So we're really proud of our engagement and I think it's because we're not we're absolutely not a group on model. And I think that's refreshing. And it's even for these markets they become sat saturated with the kind of daily deals email scenario. So what's the revenue been in the six cities to date? So actually our focus has been growing membership. So we're using only 20% of the Athens Daily Secret inventory, and we're cash flow positive. So we were able to keep our, our costs pretty low. Our tech team is in Greece. To give you a little background, Nikos and I founded and sold the company right after business school, and we're using the same tech team that we did then. And so we're kind of a, a team of four uh, that work very well together. Uh, they're based out of Athens, and it keeps our costs low. And advertising so far, we've had Shivas, Moe, we've had BMW Mini. Um, Audi. Audi. We've had, a, we've had some great h and so, so is the business model basic CPM advertising in a newsletter? It is now, and I think that I think the beautiful thing about this is that it's, it could be a Trojan horse to many other things. I know that a lot of um, you know, lead gen models like Gilt and Net-A-Porter are actually going backwards into content, so we could eventually go forward into, into other revenue streams. How do you source your content? So, such disparate places. Yeah, it is. We actually, so the reason our expansion is a little bit disparate around the world, too, because we launch where we find great partners. So we have, um, we find fantastic people in places like Lima and Mexico City and Shanghai that are intellectually curious, um, that are, you know, that are in the know in the city, that are insiders and that love doing this. Uh, it's usually a team of two or three people that are active and, and have other jobs. For example, they, they, um, we have a TV producer and a journal, famous journalist in, in, in Istanbul. Um, we have an architect and a magazine editor in Lima, etc. cetera. Uh, they are our partners on the ground, and they're our eyes and ears. And then it goes through a strict editorial process as it comes through us. Okay, so now we're into feedback, comments, advice. So a um, couple of things. One is... Uh, I, if this starts to get popular and you have you know, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 people in, in, in New York City or Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, there are going to be other folks who are going to copy this. They may even copy your content uh, as well. And so I, I think you need to figure out 
sort of when those that those onslaught of copycats come in, you know, how do you defend against that, right? So that's one. Also, two is, um, what's the life of this business? Given that each year you have to have 365 secrets, right? At what point does Mike, who's been here, you know, 20 years, he says, oh, I know that, I know about that, I know about that, and does he lose interest? Can this be a business that year after year you have, you know, you have great content? Yeah. Brian? Um, I would say, uh, number one, how do you uh, differentiate from all the other thrillists, Daily Candy, Guilt? Because the initial traction and the, you know, the growth is great, but all those other companies had the exact same initial trajectory, and then they've kind of lost their focus of what they really offer the user as they've grown. So how do you stay focused and differentiate? Um, and I think the other thing is defensibility. I think, you know, I've seen actually quite a few business models that engage some local relevant people and try to give some secrets about different businesses. So also Columbia Business School people from uh, 2010. Really? As far as the We represented the investors in Urban Daddy, and the challenge, I think, in a business like this, which, which is not insurmountable, is, is keeping the content fresh and cutting edge and interesting and evolving to be out in front of the rest of the pack because there are a lot of people out there trying to be relevant <coughs> from a content standpoint in, in urban locations. We love Urban Daddy, and we think that they've done a great job with perks and differentiating the revenue stream, keeping it fresh. You know, okay. Mike? Yeah. yeah, so my advice would be two things. I would not make all my emails commercial. Mm -hmm. I, would, I, would add, I, would, I would create almost like a game mechanic. I would think about the rhythm and cadence you're, you're developing with your users and intersperse uh, those messages with real pieces of content that are well thought out. And the second thing is there's a lot of really smart people from Daily Candy floating around this town um, that, that have a tremendous amount of accumulated experience uh, figuring this stuff out. And you know, they, they are probably the most successful, you know, I think, company like yours. Mm -hmm. And so I would tap into that, that resource. Right. Thank you. Those are all okay. very helpful. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Major. Thanks, Nicholas. So voting for daily or voting for daily secret is uh, I guess they've chosen SF Daily Secret as their Twitter handle of, of the day. Um, and Pound Ultralight, of course, and then vote for your favorite panelists. All very insightful. So Gene DeRose is up next with Sky Marker. Thank you. Um, that was great. Simple is good. Um, it's a little bit of our theme, too, I, uh, I think. So I'm going to tell two different stories, and uh, hopefully I can do it by going really fast. So Skymarker Labs is hopefully a new kind of company that is trying to be uh, an app development firm that has the characteristics and advantages of being in New York. But we think that we, we need more of that kind of mobile development it's done from uh, this end of, of the world. And um, our first app that we've created is called Want, W-A-N-T exclamation point. You can get it by uh, typing in want.it slash now. And it's a simple um, app for uh, sharing and capturing and remembering things you want. And I'll, I'll come back and talk a little more about that. Um, the, my, uh, the founders, uh, myself and my founders, uh, other founders, um, are really a diverse group of people, software developers, people that have bought and sold businesses. Um, we're equity partners with Hard Candy Shells, uh, Hard Candy Shell on uh, UX and design. Um, and, and the basic idea for Skymarker Labs is to build and market um, and monetize our own apps. One minute. One, to do apps in partnership with other companies and brands. And third, um, hopefully eventually, be an accommodating place where um, developers uh, will come so that we can build up our assets in terms of, uh, of people and software talent. Um, our basic methodology is um, focused on the consumer mobile space, and we believe that consumer-generated media, local and location, and, um, and, uh, and social media. We, we've built a code base off of this first app, which we're going to extend into a lot of other apps that we're going to come out with as rapidly as we can, um, deep extension into social networks, um, and a lot of sort of shared features and applications that can be mixed and matched in different ways. Um, our, our assets and our skills that we're trying to bring to this um, are, one, 
uh, to keep a focus on the, the cutting edge of, of smartphone capabilities. Two, um, uh, to reuse that source code and expand it. Um, three, to use our, our kind of uh, 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 career uh, basis of relationships with marketers, um, <laughs> advertisers, and publishers, and four, to push this uh, lightweight development model. One okay. last thing. Um, um, I'm, I'm a little confused here. Uh, is this a startup or a service provider? It's a startup. And this, what is your product? Our, our first product is Want. Okay. I didn't hear you talk much about Want. Well, I want to hear about Want. Yeah. So, okay. So, I'll do that really quickly. I mean, I don't know, because now you've, you've used uh, all your time talking about your service provider business. Well, it's not a I, service provider. It's an app. It's, I mean, it sounded to me like you're pitching a business that helps people, you know, that does mobile apps for money, right? No. I mean, is that no, what no, I heard? No, we, we, would, we, would, we would develop our own apps, monetize as in build them, sell them, develop them. All right, well, let, let's let the panelists chew right, them up. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I heard the same thing that, that, that Graham did, with it, that, that you're an app development shop, which is interesting, but not, you know, and it's venture fundable. Yeah. No, Check it's, this. It's, 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 yeah. it's um, no. So, 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 so I'll move to the suggestion part. Yep. Is really focus on your messaging, right? Right. I mean, if, if, you are, if you are developing these, you know, shopping, you know, platform here, then let us know that you're developing a shopping platform and this is how you're going to monetize it, and here's your target market, and here's how your great team, et cetera. I wouldn't focus on, on sort of, you know, all the other wonderful things that you guys do and are, right, just, right, right. you know, what is your business and, and right. why should I care? Right. It doesn't fit into a two-minute uh, drill very well. Um, I guess I'd agree with Gil, which is, I'm, I'm not really sure you talked about all these competitive differences. But I don't know how you're going to apply those competitive differences to products that are going to be meaningful to users. So, again, refine the messaging. If it's leveraging social technologies, if it's leveraging real-time data, if it's leveraging something, and that's going to provide a better ROI, a better user experience, a better something, sure. that would be great. Well, you're sell- I mean, part of what you're selling is your talented team. And you can see from your, your background, even though it's brief here, that... You guys have a lot of great experience, but selling as an app development company is like trying to sell as an investor a blank check company. We don't know what we're investing in. It's just too much up in the air. If you can say, here's what we did with Want, this is why Want's great, and what we did with Want, we can leverage in other apps because we can use the same code over and over again to use this type of information in this context. Too much on the capabilities and not on the uh, result, what the thing was. Mike, quick, quick comment? Yeah, I think... I think it's re- it's gonna be really hard to do what you want to do because you're gonna need an extraordinary team uh, to pull off app after app after app after app because my guess is you're gonna have some spectacular flame outs maybe sure. even this it's one a hit business yeah and and the the, the so the, the hop and the step is gonna be gone pretty quickly right among the people on your team yeah and you're gonna start to and you're gonna start to hear things like hey, maybe we should focus on one really smart idea and make it as good as possible as opposed to uh, spreading out our resources and, and doing five things not so well. Yep. You know, so, I mean, we all learn our lesson, right? I mean, right. it's incredibly hard to focus, uh, but it's, it's, you know, especially for old dogs, right? right? We've like been us, around yeah. a long time and we tend to overthink things and overthink what's going to happen around the corner. And really, the... the Cons- the, the, the approach that's really working now is staying small and focusing. Okay. Okay. Good. Great. Okay. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Seth Jot is second to last. And who's on deck? Oh, my God. Oh. No way. Graham Lawler is on deck. All right, get over. Get on. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Seth Jatsani. That's my partner, Ankit Ranka, and we are the co-founders of Share Rebate. So Share Rebate is a turnkey solution that lets mobile app developers give their users a cash rebate for sharing their app. So imagine you have a $4.99 game that a user just downloaded. After inserting dead simple integration with Share Rebate, we'll intelligently offer your users a cash rebate, say 2 bucks. Post this app on Facebook or Twitter. Obvious. It's an end-to-end solution. We handle everything. We handle the actual sharing across all platforms. 
right from the phone without interrupting the app experience. You can get back to the app right away. We track all the analytics from how many shares are happening, how many clicks are being by each share, and then with a little bit more integration with the app developer, we can tell them exactly how many downloads that they're getting from the sharing mechanism. And then the hardest part is we handle all the messy stuff of actually delivering the rebate back via gift card, PayPal, check, however the user wants it, the customer service support on that end, and monitoring fraud, preventing people from creating fake Twitter accounts to tweet and just all that messy stuff that you wouldn't want to worry about, we take care of. So we're providing an end-to-end -end solution that gives app developers a brand new distribution strategy. I don't know how many people here have a mobile app or are thinking about launching one, but distribution is the hardest problem in iOS and Android. If you're not featured in the top 100 or the top 10 or in an Apple ad, you're not going to be a success. Yeah, you'll get the lucky angry birds, but for every one of those, there's a thousand of us trying to make money on the store. So tonight, we're looking for alpha developers to join in. We have four signed up. We're looking to get to 20 by the end of the month to use our tool. Um, we're giving $100 in rebate credit to any app developer that signs up. So basically free marketing money to get more installs. On a side note, we have an e-commerce product, um, but we're focused on mobile products. I think it's a good pivot. Our business model is up there. We're going to have a free version without the rebate to sort of solve the distribution problem. Paid customers uh, will pay 10 to 30% depending on their rebate volume. And, and read about the team. And some that's sign up for the alpha, please. All right. Okay. So questions for... Satchat. Have you seen uh, Launch Rock? Yeah. Have you thought about tying this to something like that? I mean, and, and becoming, I mean, if you really want to power my apps, then, then these help me smartly track what's going on with the sharing and passing out. So give me analytics. Right. I think, I think if you could marry something like this to something like Launch Rock, I think it would be a great idea. Sweet. Good feedback. Have you seen uh, W3i? Yes. Um, I, I think along the same lines as Mike, adding that level of, uh, you know, your model on top of their distribution would be very valuable. Great. How big is this market, do you think? So that, that Apple developers and, you know, would install yeah. this and then share it yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and rebates? And yeah. That. So just in aggregate numbers, um, there were $7 billion worth of app purchases last year. That's projected to be $25 billion in 2015. And we're going to grow that number, right? We're going to make app developers more money. And but that's, not, that's not your market share. If you had 100% no, no, it's not. market it's, share, you wouldn't have yeah, $7 yeah, yeah. billion. No, no I agree. I, the yeah. point was that was the baseline number. And then so our job will be to increase that number faster. And I think another job we'll have is to democratize distribution in the app store. So Zynga can distribute their app to millions of people every day. And every, every app, whether it's good or bad, will be a hit. But I launch an app, and my app could be the best, but the distribution <laughs> How model isn't. sharing there. goes on today, do you think? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's a hard thing to figure out how many people share apps. I don't think but I've it, never shared an but app. The pro but it's a really broken process. Imagine playing a game. How are you going to share that app with your friend? You're going to go to your iTunes, select the link, open up your email, get, put the guy's email address, put the iTunes link there, and share it. All right, so let's go into comments. Uh, Mike, why don't you start? Yeah, so I'll just... Uh, reiterate what I said earlier, I would, I would create a more uh, complete solution that solves the problem for me and giving me in sort of an easy sign-up process with uh, some analytics around what, what passing, you know, who are the people that are passing and sharing, I think, I think would be a great way to, to acquire customers. Okay. I like the idea. I, I, I question the size of the market, but one, one of the things that I think I would do, if, if, you're, gonna, if you're raising money now, twenty to $50,000 may not be enough. You may want to reconsider what your budget is for distribution to try and get in front of these app, these app developers. And, and also you're offering a rebate, uh, credit for, for the rebates. You might want a little bit, have a little bit more incentive there. So perhaps consider raising the size of the amount you're trying to do. Okay. Um, I think I'd focus a little bit more on the uh, analytics and also, you know, you're really an affiliate network. So, you know, to some extent, how would you then get distribution for your own affiliate network? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, on, uh, let me just touch a little bit on, on the, uh, uh, the amount of the raise. So $50,000 should be able to get that from, from friends and family. 
and um, uh, or business associates you know, you know, five grand here, two grand here, ten grand there. Um, um, uh, and I think it would serve you to raise that 50 grand, get some traction, show some metrics to be able to then raise, you know, the real round of, you know, the, the you know, half a million or million dollar round, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, part of what we look at as, as VCs is can this dog hunt, right? Can this entrepreneur, can they hunt? Can they hunt for customers? Can they hunt for investors? Can they hunt for partners, for employees, et cetera? And uh, someone who comes and asks for, for $50,000, which, which to some people it's, it's a lot of money, but when you look at your, your family, extended family, et cetera, um, says to me that, that you know, the entrepreneur hasn't gone out hunting yet for, for some of that low-hanging hanging fruit. Okay, that's time. Great. Thanks, Sajjab. Uh To vote for share rebate... How do we do that? Um, pound ultralight and at share rebate. Uh, so I've recruited um, Sergey Chernyshev here to drive uh, the browser. Well, about two minutes of work, right? Two minutes. That's right. Time to take out the rotten fruit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is a rare event. Have you ever uh, pitched? I, I think I have pitched here. Um, it's been a long time, maybe a year or two years. So. Um, I think it's a great format, though, and I really appreciate the fact that I have uh, these particular set of uh, bright individuals to pitch for. Okay, your time starts now. Okay. <laughs> so my name, is, my name is Graham Lawler. In addition to Ultralight Startups, I am also the founder of a startup called BrightMap, which is uh, uh, a lead generation ad network for professional service providers, professional service providers such as lawyers, accountants, web design and development agencies, PR agencies, office space providers and that sort of thing. Uh, so this is something that I have innovated for use at Ultralight Startups, and I'm now bringing to other uh, event organizers uh, that are running professional business networking events. The way it works is when you register for a ticket at Ultralight Startups, uh, you go to a site called Eventbrite, and you fill in your name and your email address and some various details. At the bottom of that registration page, there's a question that says, do you need help with your startup? Would you like to be connected with Ultralight's preferred service providers? Check up the two boxes. It's free. And there you see a bunch of check boxes for those types of service provider types that we see here. And about 25% of people that register for Ultralight startups check at least one of those boxes. And on average, they check about two. So for every 100 people that register, we generate about 50 leads. And then we sell those leads to professional service providers in those categories for a price of either $20 if it's a multi-sell to three different vendors or $50 if it only goes to one vendor. Um, so the, uh, the business is to expand this beyond Ultralight and to offer this as a service to anybody else that's running professional uh, business networking events uh, as an ad network. So I would um, basically, they sign up for it. They just, it takes a couple of minutes to uh, to tweak their Eventbrite page to um, get it so that I can, I can add this question and I can pull the data out of it and make the email introductions. Um, and uh, I just split the revenue with them. So 50-50, just like any other ad network. Um, so we, how much time do I have left? Three seconds. Wow. Well, that's it. <laughs> Good, perfect timing, okay. So, questions for Graham. Yeah. So, so I like the value proposition a lot. Clearly it's, it's solving a problem. The question I have is, so, so what's the strategy around distribution? How do you get those partnerships, maybe the partnerships with Eventbrite and Meetup and, and some of those, those guys, and, and, and how do you pitch it so that they get value out of it as well? The Eventbrites and the Meetups? Yeah. Um, you know, we may it, actually... If, if that's your distribution strategy. It, it is. It's a big yeah. part of it. Um, there may actually be somebody from Eventbrite here today, Stacy Perkins, uh, who... I've told about this app, and my understanding is that Eventbrite is really in the business of taking a margin on ticket sales, and that's, that's what they do. And so whatever I can do to get more events onto Eventbrite, they're very happy with, and they're very happy to partner with me. And right now, this is strictly Eventbrite, although other ticketing and registration uh, you know, systems exist. They have APIs. We could be on top of those as well. Right now, if you want to be on BrightMap, you have to be on Eventbrite, and therefore, I'm a lead channel for them, so they should 
uh, want to work with me, they also have an app directory of other third-party apps that work on Eventbrite, and I would be listed in that. I'm currently not, but I would be. Uh, so it, it seems like a symbiotic relationship. Uh, maybe a slightly broader question is, you know, there's, there's it's a, like any other ad network, it's, it's two-sided market. I need, I need the publishers, which in this case are the uh, event organizers, and I need the lead buyers. And so we have different strategies for attracting each of those respectively. Um, for the, uh, the event organizers, it is a direct sales uh, primarily. Um, so this is my calling them, and there's a listing of all the events that go on, in, say, in New York City uh, that do uh, you know, business network events. I think there's about 700 a month on Eventbrite alone uh, just in New York City. Um, so talking to them, um, there's also a referral program. So if you're a lead buyer and you already go to an event that's not already on BrightMap, you can get free leads by referring them to BrightMap. Um, and the lead buyer acquisition strategy is, uh, is, is, is a lot more technology driven, and that is the co-registration form. When you sign up for an event, there's actually two questions there. The first question is, do you need help with your service provider? So that generates the leads. I'm sorry, do you need help with your startup? And that generates the leads. And the second question is, are you a service provider that wants to meet these companies attending this event? And if so, check here. And that will, uh, that will put you into our lead funnel. Other questions? I know that was a very comprehensive answer. Mike? Have you tested this outside of your own events? Yes. Because you said you had a click-through rate. What was it, click-through rate? Go, go, go to the home page. I like that one a little better. Which one? Uh, the, you should be able to. There you go. So we have two other events, Ultralight Startups New York, Ultralight Boston. Both of those are revenue generating right now. We're, we're generating and selling leads. Um, and Do It In Person and Tech Drink Up, two of the fan, most fantastic events in New York City other than Ultralight Startups. So I recommend you go there. And, and when you do register, you'll see some check boxes at the bottom that you should check on. Um, so we have tested it. We, are, we do generate leads. Uh, people do pay for the leads. The leads do convert at some, at some rate. Uh, which I think we can uh, we can continue to improve, but the the basis of it is 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 there for sure. Is the challenge the volume of leads, the volume of clickers? Um, I I don't think so. I mean, I, one thing I don't want to do is incentivize people ch to check on the on the check boxes. I want it to be fully opt in. Mm -hmm. You you check on the box legal because you really need a lawyer. Because if you're checking the box legal to win a free iPad, then the lawyer's not going to be too happy with those leads in the future. Um, so, I, you know, I don't want to really incentivize or choose that side of it in any way. It's, it's, it's really got to be genuine. I have no doubt about the quality. I'm just, I'm just wondering, you know, if there's some event in Omaha, Nebraska, and, and they've never heard of your brand in ultralight startups, and I see this button, am I really going to click? Oh, uh, well, ultralight startups is, is not part of this at all. Uh, okay. The bright map is the, right. is the product, and it's not a consumer-facing brand at all. You know, your, your user experience, about... 50 people in this room checked at least one of those boxes. They got the email intros. Uh, they're in touch with the service providers that are taking these leads right now. They never saw the name BrightMap during the entire process. It's not a part Did of it. Did they think it was just a button provided by Eventbrite? Uh, well, the wording of the question is, do you want to be connected with Ultralight Startup's preferred service providers? So the, the similar checkbox on the Tech Drink Up site would be, do you want to be connected with Tech Drink Up's oh, preferred okay. service so you, so you align yourself with that local exactly. brand. And furthermore, okay. the email intro comes from the event organizer personally. Got it. So for Tech Drink Up, it's Michael Gold. It comes from him. I, you know, the organizer of this event, am yeah. just, you know, donating so your my challenge, Your challenge will be if, if there is an event in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, you're going to have to find service providers that want to buy those leads. Right. And as I said, that side of it comes from they're already attending these events. I mean, people right. have already, you know, service providers attend my events routinely to meet leads, right? And this yep. just helps them find the right people to do that. Oh, oh sure. my gosh, I forgot to start the timer. <laughs> I, I, I think you may have gone just a little bit over. Why don't we transition into advice for, <laughs> for Bright Map? Go. So, so I, I like the starting point here, and I think it's really interesting that you have so the tip of the spear here is using events um, like this that, that where, where there's you know, a good match for people who want and people who have. Um, I would look to sort of how does this become a really big business? So once you have those service providers and, and, and others, how does this sort of adapt itself to other similar you know, sort, sorts of um, ecosystems? Um, and, uh, and, and then how do you, you know, build, the, build that? Because you know, to, to Mike's point, this is going to be really about scale, a scale of service providers and sale, scale of those people who, who have a need. 
Brian? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing is, you know, how do you get to scale in any ad network? So, you know, what's your focus on your strategy to get as many events and as many local service providers in those given markets and focus on that? And to focus on the, uh, the traditional reluctance of service providers like accountants and lawyers to take and pay for cold referrals, uh, they're often worried that, uh, that, that they're wasting their time and money and worse with a cold referral like that. And there are certain, I think, areas of the law, accounting and other service providers, that are more amenable to these types of lead. Uh, lead gen- they use the word cold as pejorative. There are certain areas that are more open to it than others, and I would, I would concentrate my resources there. Yeah, I would, I would see if I could spread out uh, at some point beyond startups and tech startups and see how applicable this is. It probably is applicable to lots of other industries, and I think that's probably how you get this to be really big. Um, I would also, I, don't know, I would think about trying to bootstrap this a little longer. Um, it seems like uh, it's going to throw off a lot of cash right away. And Wrong with that. <laughs> and so why not bootstrap it a little longer, gain a little more firepower, and then go out and, and raise and raise money. Or do a small, you know, pass the hat instead of grabbing a half million. You should do it as an ultralight startup, I think. That's a, that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, on that application form, it says I'm looking for $500,000 just because that's a round number. I'm not looking for any money, actually. I'm just looking for your advice. But thank you very much. All right. Graham Lawler. Right now. All right, and if you want to vote for Graham, he is actually in the race. Um, and we, we promise we will count it you know, no, fairly. No, don't vote for me. I don't want to don't win vote for my, him. my own yeah, contest. He shouldn't win. There's nine but, other... But, like, two people should at least vote for him so he so feels good. So I don't good. feel bad. All right. Yeah. So don't everybody vote. Uh, so, but do, you should vote for your panelists. I think they were all fantastic. Yes. And it's going to be... A round of applause for the panelists. Thank you. It's going to be very hard to choose. Um, which panelists gave the most insightful advice. So, in the meantime, we are going to be, I, I would say this is a good time to vote. If, you're, if you've been holding back, trying to figure out who to vote for, which panelists, which startup, uh, now is the time. We're going to be telling that momentarily. And in the interim, we are going to uh, thank our local sponsors. And uh, if we can just hang on for a moment. What's that? The handle, put the handles back up so they know who to tweet for. Okay. Yeah, just leave can, this up. Can so you see this? It's also, it's also in the handout that you, uh, you all got. So, um, tr- you know, if, try, and, uh, try and hang in there while we, while we uh, announce our local sponsors. So, let's see. Michael Kislin is uh, wealth planning. And if anybody checked in the box for wealth planning as registering for this event... You will have been introduced to Michael, um, so he can help you uh, figure out what to do with all the millions that you get after you have sold your startup. Um, Seamless Web sponsored our pizza. Uh, they are a food ordering online food ordering service. Uh, it's now it's now simply Seamless. Seamless. That's exactly right. Uh, SourcePad is a web design and development agency. Is uh, Rob Sherrod here? Rob is in the back, Gosh. waving his hand. So some of you may Mind have been introduced to, to Rob already. Uh, Aaron Hoven of Lemonade Heroes is our photographer today. And he's in the back, waving his hand as well. David Carlos, Managed Information Architects. David, you want to say what you do? Yeah, let me just take, take everybody's attention for two brief minutes. I, I am very proud and excited to actually be... <laughs> A sponsor now, not just not just a pretty face, but I'm a sponsor for Ultralight Startups. This is really great. But uh, just to give you guys two quick seconds about who I am other than the pretty face is uh, I actually have an IT consulting firm that specializes in business development consulting using technology. You know, we use information technology to help businesses solve problems, grow, uh, shrink, whatever it is they need to do, uh, but we do it through technology. So a lot of the people in this room are very interesting because you're, you have these tech startups, right? And you think you know everything about technology, but it turns out that developers are actually pretty bad at setting up basic IT infrastructure uh, like you know, email and you know, file sharing and things like that. So if anybody's looking for that, that's what I do. Uh, I'm also the CTO of a startup uh, called My Homepage that uh, maybe I'm going to pitch. I'm getting excited after seeing you. you. 
Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll pitch. Just fantastic yeah. feedback. Nice. I mean, you know, who knows whether we'll get this particular set of four. It, it um, will never be this, this oh, fabulous we'll have again. A voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and lastly, Todd Barish of Indicate Media. Todd, is Todd still here? Todd was like the coach. Uh, so he, P- Indicate Media is a marketing communications and PR firm. Uh, that, and he's been on a couple of ultralight panels, and he, he offers a service of, of coaching the startups that are pitching here uh, for an hour and helping them figure out how to, how to pitch. So I, th- I think about four or five of the startups that pitched here uh, took advantage of that. And nice. um, so congratulations to them and to Todd. Uh, some announcements. Uh, we're going to be doing this event, the Feedback Forum, uh, in five weeks on Thursday, October 13th at NYU. Here are three of the four panelists that we have finalized. Uh, Brian Cohen, Paul Siabica, uh, Jonathan Stillman, and uh, one more that's to be confirmed. So if you have a startup, actually, we've already started taking applications for the pitches. About half of them are, half of the five or ten pitch slots are already taken. So uh, if you want to pitch in October, you should jump on it. You're already behind. Um, (laughs) Media partners, if you have over 2,000 Twitter followers, you get into Ultralight for free. Um, Dan, uh, you want to give your announcement? Yeah, yeah come, come on up. up. So basically, this is uh, something new we're trying. Uh, if you've pitched here in the past, you can take about 20 seconds or 30 seconds to <laughs> give an update about what happened since the last month. Thanks. Would you mind just back and the website? W-H-I-L-D? Yes. That movie? Hi, my name is Dan Tashman. I'm CEO of Tomato Lightning. Last month, I uh, came here and pitched our mobile startup, Get a Game, which is a geosocial service connecting people looking for pickup games and sport play. Uh, after hearing some feedback from the panel, what we did in, in, is we realized that we had a very uh, easy and interesting pivot that we could transform our industry into a B2B white label service that, uh, where we provide... Uh, mobile platform, a, a really feature-rich geosocial platform with management capabilities uh, to websites, uh, universities, online communities, print magazines, anyone looking to get into the mobile space. We offer a turnkey solution including a calendar, location and event awareness, as I said, user unification, uh, group management and uh, social media integration, hyperlocal deals, gotcha. and a reskinable UI. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, trying to keep this down so it doesn't turn into another pitch. Uh, so well done. All right. So now I believe our row feeder s- system is not working over there, in which case I'm going to have to It'll work. Oh. count these votes right here in front of you. I'd like, to, I'd like to mention that the system that counts all your tweets, I wrote myself in JavaScript in like 200 lines of code. That is uh, my most recent and most yeah. proud... Wow. Uh, coding accomplishment. Who knew? So let's see who has won, shall we? To do, to do. Sort. Oops. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, so normally th- there's a level of ex- a suspense here. Okay, everybody, <laughs> pretend you didn't see this. Close your eyes. All right, number three, with 12 votes. I should just, I'm going to unplug this. You can oh, read it. Oh, yay. <laughs> Look at that. <coughs> ha ha, we have the plug. Okay. <laughs> okay, so with 12 votes, da 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 big drum roll, it is Nelby News. $200 for Nelby News. Where are they? Oh, yeah, in the back. Come on up. Come on up. Stand and be, be observed. Then in second place with 26 votes. Wow, look at these numbers are getting big. It is the people who can't spell. Curious app. Where are they? John Federico. Oh, yes. All right. And I believe there is a U in there. It's uh, Q-U. It's part of the English language. Okay. Finally, at number one with 50 votes. This may be the most votes anybody's ever gotten in the history of votes. I don't know if that's true. I'm making it up, but it sounds very exciting. It is SF Daily Secret. It is Daily Secret. Where are you guys? Somewhere back there. I know there's something. All right. So, uh, $200 Amazon web credits for all of them. Anything else? That's right. Oh, and uh, they all get to pitch at um, oh, and New York just Angels. New York Angels, dude. You guys are like in like Flynn. This Automatic is great. bid to New York Angels. Congratulations. Don't even have to do anything other than having done um, that. The panel uh, audience choice award for the best panelists. It looks like, from what I can see, there's a very tight grouping. Uh, there is a winner. Um, but one of you has one more votes than the second place person. 
And that is Brad Harrison. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Overcoming Tim the voice. Uh, uh, Demi Moore voice. Yeah, you got you got your sexy Flynn. It's awesome. Well done. Okay, so this event is, is over. That's it. Uh, I done. would say though, my advice to the panel oh, session: yes. once once I stop talking, everybody's going to come up and talk to you, and there's going to be a big jam up in the front of the room, and it's going to last for like thirty minutes or forty minutes. I can stop them. We if want you to want. try and avoid yeah. that. The way to avoid that is for you guys to. Get out the door. Right. And go go across the street to Heartland Brewery. Right across the street, and whether you're not whether you're going to stay there or not, just tell everybody that that's where you're going to meet them. <laughs> so uh, unfortunately, I have to leave. But if somebody wants to contact me, I'm Gil G I L at Janicast.com. So just remind me that you were here, and I'll be happy to set something up or read something or what have you. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gil. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Ed, and thanks, Mike. Thank you.